Thanks, Brett. That's a great question. I just feel like the time is right. I mean, I have been at Wharton for about five years now. I've been teaching brain science for business to MBA students, undergraduates, uh, as well as uh, leaders in the field, practitioners through executive education. And, um, you know, it's really clear that the insights and technologies from neuroscience can have a major impact on business and everything from marketing and brand strategy to um, leadership to management and to um, inspiring innovation. And so, you know, my goal is really to reach a much wider audience so that everybody can benefit from the lessons of neuroscience. I've been fascinated with monkeys since I was a kid um, because they're so similar to us in so many ways. I mean, that's why there's so much fun to uh, watch at the zoo. And as I moved through my academic career, I was really trying to understand human nature and, you know, why we are in some ways so similar to our monkey cousins and in some ways different. And so I spent a lot of time actually out in the field, out in the jungle, uh, watching monkeys and, and learning from them and uh, eventually decided that if I wanted to understand what makes us human, I would have to understand how our brains work and how that leads to the decisions that we make. And so, you know, we've learned a lot from monkeys. We've learned a lot about what is core to our nature as primates in terms of the importance of social connections. But we've also learned a lot about the ways in which forming strong connections with others can actually help you through times of crisis. So those are just a couple of the things we've learned, um, but they're really, you know, they're, they're wonderful critters in their own right, and, um, and they make for a great comparison with people. I think it's really critical to have full appointments in the School of Medicine, the School of Arts and Sciences, and the Wharton Business School, because it really plants my feet firmly in the disciplines that are so important for driving our work, which, you know, takes the kind of the, the problem set from business and leadership, uh, looks at it through the lens of psychology and uh, utilizes the techniques and technologies um, from neuroscience. And so you take all of that, all of that rich uh, interdisciplinary heritage and um, technologies and kind of funnel it into how we, how can we use that those um, that information and the, and the insights from those different disciplines pooled together to uh, address some of the biggest challenges facing business and facing society uh, at large. And so I'm really, really happy and thrilled to kind of serve as the bridge and connector between those three schools. Yeah, this is a great question. I think that um, there are a few things that are, I think, really important insights from neuroscience. I mean, one that is so critical is that, you know, we are human beings and we are social creatures by nature. We're wired that way. And so one of the, the, the most important jobs of a leader is to uh, connect with the people that uh, they manage uh, and to help create environments in which people can work together uh, efficiently and effectively uh, and with great uh, esprit de corps. And so there are a variety of lessons from neuroscience that teach us how to do that better. Uh, everything, you know, from, from things as simple as making eye contact with the people with whom you're talking to um, utilizing some, you know, technology to potentially uh, get people on the same wavelength and, and synchronize their brains in a way that promotes trust and cooperation. We've been studying the circuits that underlie creativity and innovation in my lab for almost 20 years. And one thing that the neuroscience has revealed is that there are two mutually opposed networks in the brain, one that subserves focus and carrying out routine tasks, and the other which uh, underlies our ability to think outside the box, explore and be creative. And what's really kind of uh, very clear from the neuroscience data is that when one of these networks is turned on, the other one is turned off. And so this has some really practical implications. So if you're sitting there in front of your computer working on an Excel spreadsheet or doing some other kind of routine task, you're not going to dream up the next iPad or iPhone. Uh, so it's really important to disengage from routine uh, focused work if you need to have creative thoughts. And, you know, a corollary to that is you can really help your brain disengage and get into uh, creative mode by getting up, walking around, 
walking outside. So that's something I do uh, every day. I, I tend to get up about every 20 minutes or so uh, throughout the day and go for a walk. And, you know, it clears your head, but it also really does allow that innovation engine in your brain um, to jumpstart and, and allow you to think of new things. You know, the movement to remote work uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed, I think, how important face-to-face -face communication is. And it can really be challenging uh, when doing so online because of just some of the features of the technology in, where, in which there, for example, is an offset between where the camera is on your computer uh, and where the screen is, which makes it very difficult to make eye contact with someone you're talking to. That's compounded when there are multiple different faces on the screen in a Zoom or Blue Jeans kind of Brady Bunch um, window. So, you know, that's a challenge. I think that um, things we can, you know, try to do to overcome that is to uh, be aware of where the camera is. And when you're saying something that's really important, uh, try to look into the camera. I think another um, strategy is to, to recognize that Zoom fatigue is real. Uh, because I think it's so challenging to try to read all of the social cues that we're seeing uh, on the people who are on the screen. And so it's important to uh, build in time between meetings and in some cases, even turn off the video and just go for a pure audio call. And that can you know, potentially give you a little bit of rest from, uh, from all the hard work of trying to decipher what's going on uh, on the video. I think if managers and leaders can pay attention to the latest developments in neuroscience, um, this can be potentially very helpful uh, in a number of ways. I mean, one of the most important things that neuroscience can help with is to validate uh, the sci you know, scientifically uh, strategies that we may have already stumbled upon just through um, trial and error uh, over, you know, over eons. And so I think that you know, if we think about uh, the importance of teamwork uh, and good communication, uh, neuroscience only serves to underline that. Um, we know from the neuroscience, for example, that if we want to communicate more effectively with the people we manage, then we need to be uh, simple, clear, uh, and concise, and again, make eye contact uh, as much as possible. And the neuroscience is very strong on this, and that will lead to, you know, those kinds of practices will lead to better chemistry uh, with the person you're communicating with, uh, getting into better synchrony with them, and uh, more effective communication uh, thereafter. Well, sports is a great petri dish for work and for life. Um, and one of the reasons why and why I'm so compelled by sports is that the margins are so slim. So if we can help an athlete or a team to achieve one or 2% better performance, that could be the difference between a gold medal and nothing or winning a championship, uh, you know, and, and failing to qualify for the playoffs. So uh, the potential impact of any improvement is, uh, is enormous. And um, the other thing about sports is that at this point, uh, when we're talking about elite college athletes or, or professional athletes, Everything from the head down is, has been pretty well optimized. And so the, the remaining um, kind of bang for the buck that we can get is on kind of optimizing mental performance. And so, you know, this is something that's uh, very early on. There's tremendous uh, interest and enthusiasm. And it's something that we've been working on uh, in my own laboratory. And one really uh, fun study that we did was, to, was with the Penn rowing team. And we looked at this phenomenon that we are fascinated in, which is uh, physiological synchrony. Basically, when we connect well with others, our brain activity and even our physiological processes like our heart rate um, become uh, aligned, they become synchronized. And the degree of physiological synchrony uh, in the laboratory seems to predict things like cooperation and trust and communication. And so what we did was to actually go out to the Penn Rowing Center, uh, we were in the field um, and we put uh, EEG monitors on, on the athletes' heads to measure their brain activity and heart rate monitors. And we looked at physiological synchrony when they were either rowing, uh, training next to each other on uh, ERG machines, rowing machines, um, training apart, 
or when they were physically, their herb machines were physically connected. Um, of course, when they were physically connected, this meant that their uh, rowing was physically uh, in time, in synchrony. And so we saw the highest degree of physiological synchrony under those conditions. But we saw very similar physiological synchrony just when the rowers were next to each other, where they could see and hear and um, perhaps smell each other. And so that's really exciting because it tells us that if you want your team to perform in synchrony, which is critical to rowing, uh, you ought to have them train together and not train uh, on their own. Well, there's tremendous opportunity in applying neuroscience to business because, you know, frankly, business runs on brains. So the more we understand about the people we manage, the more we understand about our customers, the better we can do. But this does present some serious ethical, legal, and societal um, challenges and questions. And, uh, you know, there's this is very new. Um, and I think what's really critical is that we have to engage uh, our employees and engage the public in this conversation. So it's not that we as scientists or we as managers uh, have exclusive purchase on what's right and what's wrong. Um, there are very important principles that have been laid down uh, by, for example, uh, President Obama's um, Bioethics Commission, uh, which you know outlined the importance of privacy and consent and autonomy which are critical, whether we're talking about brain data or um, you know the websites that you search uh, online. I think one final consideration that is actually really, really important is access to this knowledge and this technology. So, if um, you know if rich people or rich companies uh, have um, you know unequal access to uh, the insights and and technologies and capabilities of neuroscience, that then that could potentially uh, exacerbate uh, existing uh, inequality in the society. So I think that um, neuroscience has tremendous potential, but we have to use it wisely. There are two sort of sets of developments in neuroscience that are you know, at the cutting edge and that are going to be critically important. Um, on the one hand, there are developments that are purely technological that are getting really, really allowing us to refine our understanding of what's going on at fundamental uh, levels in the brain at the level of molecules uh, and synapses. And, and that work will continue. Um, that work uh, at the moment is largely confined to animals, but the technologies will eventually find, those, find their way into humans to help with uh, clinical problems like depression or anxiety or autism, et cetera. The other direction I think that uh, will be critically important, especially for business and for society, is the development of wearable um, brain monitoring technologies, which allow individuals to access what's going on in their heads so they can understand um, what, what is going on and they can uh, use that knowledge to uh, improve their performance. And I think that's very, very exciting. Uh, in the past, it's only, you know, the, there's been a trade-off between the quality of the data you could get and the uh, ease and wearability uh, of the devices. And, you know, those two um, trade-offs are now uh, kind of coming together so that we can actually monitor brain activity uh, with uh, very high fidelity and do so in a way that is very comfortable uh, and very unobtrusive. I, mean, I think one really important lesson is that the so-called uh, irrational biases that we see in the kinds of decisions that we make, whether they're uh, the decisions leaders make, uh, our employees or our customers, that they're actually the result of, of fundamental processes in our brain that are, that are deeply baked in uh, and difficult to overcome. Um, and so we should not uh, beat ourselves up about it but rather uh, rely on some of the, the techniques that um, neuroscience has suggested can help us to get around some of those challenges.